It was the year that King Uzziah died. Now that may not mean much to us because we are detached from the ancient world of the scriptures and we have no monarchy. Although we Americans now want to claim the Duchess of Sussex as our own, don't we? (laughs) With all the hype over the royal wedding, you'd think that we had crown fever here in the United States. But I suppose on this Memorial Day weekend especially, we are reminded of the freedoms of our elective democratic society and the sacrifices of those who have helped preserve it. We may not have a monarchy here, and we may not live in biblical times, but we can understand, I think, that the death of a king would be a tumultuous event in the ancient world. And King Uzziah wasn't just any king. It was the 8th century BCE, and he took the throne at age 16 and ruled for over 52 years. His reign was one of the most prosperous since the time of Solomon. He was resourceful in his military might. He refortified the country. He reorganized and re-equipped the army. And he personally engaged in agricultural pursuits, helping out the economy of the people. He was a vigorous and able ruler. And as 2 Chronicles says, his name spread abroad, even to the entrance of Egypt. But it was King Uzziah's pride that led to his downfall. He entered the temple to burn some incense on the altar one day, and Azariah, who was the high priest at the time, saw this as an attempt to usurp the prerogatives of the priest. And so he confronted King Uzziah, not just by himself, but with 80 priests with him, and said, you can't do that. Burning incense is only for the priests, the sons of Aaron. We are consecrated to do this, not you. Now the way the story goes, at that moment there was an earthquake and all of a sudden Uzziah was struck with leprosy. And he was driven from the temple and compelled to reside in a house until his death. So essentially, Uzziah was successful for decades, but then when pride got the best of him, he was supposedly smote by God, dethroned, and quarantined. And 50 plus years of building stability came crashing down. Add to these circumstances the general sense of dislocation and instability that comes with the death of any king or leader, and Isaiah's words in the year that King Uzziah died begin to carry some weight for us. We might even understand them better if we modernize them a bit. In the year that Pearl Harbor was bombed, in the year that JFK was assassinated, in the year that Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated, in the year of 9-11, in the year of Hurricane Katrina or Hurricane Harvey, in the year of Columbine or Sandy Hook or the Pulse nightclub. Those events throw societies into chaos, but on a more personal level, we all have our own ways of marking time too. In the year that mother died, in the year my son was diagnosed, in the year I lost my job, in the year we had that accident. The point being, we mark time by significant events in our lives. And like Isaiah, as we pass through transitions and crises, God may very well meet us there with a new vision and a fresh word. 
It is in the midst of human loss and suffering, in the midst of separation and disconnection, that Isaiah sees this grand vision of God with a robe filling the temple and seraphim fluttering about, singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of your glory. These words of praise are actually the oldest part of the liturgy of the church. They're part of the Sanctus, which is a fancy word for him. They date back as far as the first century, and they became an integral part of worship in the sixth century. And from the early church on, the hope in singing these words, the hope is that when we sing them or say them, we too are transported back to a moment like Isaiah was, back to a moment where we see and understand the majesty and awe of God. And the divisions around us crumble. All of a sudden, we are reminded of what matters. These are not only words of praise, but of hope. Hope that in the face of whatever we might be experiencing, God is being worshipped and adored. So, no matter what is happening in our lives, war or terrorism, economic meltdown, ecological crises, the death of someone we love, whatever we may be experiencing, Isaiah's testimony is here to tell us that God is to be praised even in these times and is worthy of that praise. Now, this sentiment forms what I'm calling the first call in a threefold call that Isaiah gives us. It is Trinity Sunday, after all, had to get in that threefold nature. This is not just a threefold call for Isaiah, but it is for us as well. This first call of praising and honoring God in the midst of turmoil and unrest reminds us that God is God and we are not. And that the world is much bigger than it seems. With all these graduations throughout the month of May, we might think of commencement ceremonies as a parallel vision to that of Isaiah's. We're reminded at graduations for at least a brief moment and sometimes by an inspiring speech that there is a whole big world out there, and we've just seen the tip of the iceberg. Our lives have been full and amazing, and we've done great things as students, but it's only just the beginning. The future is grand. The possibilities and potential is limitless. Like the flowing robes of God that filled the temple in Isaiah's vision, students imagine their futures flowing out before them. They see their journey into the world with hope and optimism. Any kind of mountaintop experience in your own life, or even sometimes travel, does this as well for us, right? It expands our vision of seeing that there is something, namely God, that is so much bigger than us. So the first call in our threefold call as Christians is not to get distracted by our fear-filled world, but to recognize the majesty, majesty and wonder of God and to rest for a few moments at least in that state of awe. Your image of God doesn't have to be some big person in a temple with large robes and seraphim flying around. Your image of God is whatever your image of God is. It's anything that pulls you out of yourself and into the awe and mystery of the divine. Now sometimes when we're in the midst of such awe and mystery and majesty, we can feel kind of small, right? Like when you're gazing up at the sky of stars at night, all of a sudden you realize that you're a really small person on a really small planet in a huge universe. And sometimes if we start to feel small, we can start to feel unworthy, like our lives won't make a difference. And this is what we see Isaiah struggle with in our text. 
upon seeing the majesty of God, he immediately goes into a state of confession, saying, woe is me, I am lost. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. He invites us into what I'm calling our second call. That is to name and acknowledge our own role and participation in the state of unrest in the world and in our lives. Do you notice that Isaiah's confession shows that he understands it's not just his lips that are unclean. It's the whole system around him too. And before God can use him to help do something about this, Isaiah has to have his own eyes opened to this fact. We often think about confessing sin as admitting guilt. And when we do that, sometimes sin can start to make us feel bad about ourselves and unworthy. It can actually make us spiteful and resentful. Sometimes when we confess our sins, we fall into this theology that puts us in a role of always trying to appease God. But God does not seek to be appeased. God seeks to be loved, and God seeks for us to love others. So I'd like us to think about confession today as something that doesn't make us feel guilty or unworthy, or like we're being blamed, but perhaps by thinking of it as an awakening, a coming to an awareness of something we weren't aware of before. Confessing sin for the purpose of beating ourselves up helps no one. But as Isaiah shows us, admitting our own participation in language or systems or behaviors that harm others or our world or ourselves, well, that is a powerful springboard for change. A few weeks ago, Becky Whitaker, Christine Flug, and myself, who are all members of the leadership team of our Calvary New Hope Partnership, went to a training held by the Denver Public Schools on becoming a culturally responsive educator. Dr. Rosemary Allen led the training, and a lot of it was just about recognizing and learning how we come to have implicit bias in our life. We all have biases. We're born and raised into them, and the media and culture continue to feed us these biases. And one of the most powerful things I took away from this seminar was when she said, you do not need to feel guilty or ashamed of your implicit bias. You didn't ask for your implicit bias. It's just a part of who you are. We don't need to feel guilty, she says. Guilt doesn't create goodness. But we need to learn to recognize these biases and gradually change them. And that's what will change the world. Again, this gets us out of a system of bl blame and instead invites us into a system of change. I know one thing I've been working on is becoming aware of how I speak about people. One example is instead of naming people as homeless, my friend and colleague Morgan has taught me to use the language of people experiencing homelessness. This is person-first language. And if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. I don't go around calling some of you uh, homeowners or apartment renters. So why would I name and call someone homeless as their first identifier? And yet we all do it all the time. And in doing so, we remove dignity from that person. And we make assumptions about them that may or may not be true and even if it is true, should in no way define them. So when we recognize things like that, that may seem little, a shift from homeless to people experiencing homelessness, it's actually not little at all. It's a way of confessing our sin, a way of learning to be aware of ways that we speak and behave that hurt others. Isaiah noticed that others had unclean lips too. And so he knew it wasn't just him. It was the society around him too. 
when he recognizes the magnitude of God and what God represents, that's the point that Isaiah says, woe is me. But it's not a pity party. He takes this vision of God that he has, and he says, I'm no longer going to be blind and deaf to behaviors that separate me from God and others. He's enlightened in a way and energized to change. And this is what leads to our third call. The point at which Isaiah says, here I am. This call is all about being open to the ways that God wants to use us in the world as a vessel for healing and love. And it's being open to the call wherever it leads. If you keep reading in Isaiah, just the verses after we stopped reading today, you'll see that Isaiah's call does not lead to an easy place. In fact, the road gets harder for a long time before it ever gets easier. But the difference is, Isaiah acknowledges that he is with God and not walking the journey alone. You know, at the turn of the 16th century, Copernicus formulated the theory that contrary to appearances, the sun does not revolve around the earth, but the earth revolves around the sun. In the same way, when we search for what we should do in our life, we usually place ourselves at the center of the world first and try to make sense of it all, thinking that God is somehow part of our life, that God is out there orbiting somewhere. But perhaps, as one pastor put it, what we need is to have Copernican revolutions in our lives. To realize that God is not part of our life. Rather, we are part of God's life. God is the center of everything. And our lives revolve around God. And God's unique call for us. This is a moment of vocational identity for Isaiah that's very powerful. I think this whole text invites us to think about where we are in our lives right now and how God is causing us to become aware of the ways in which we need to open our eyes to the needs of those around us. It's a threefold call. It's a pattern that we see not just in this text, but in our everyday lives. As a reminder, the three parts. The first, in a world that seems crazy and out of our control, we are to worship, to remind ourselves of God's majesty and wonder. The second call, we are to confess our sin as a means of recognizing that our own actions play a part in the state of our world and our lives. And the third part, upon realizing God's forgiveness, we're renewed to get up and try again to make a difference in the world, to say, here I am, send me. It's the first Sunday of summer. And so I'm going to invite you over the next three months to pick one of these calls and explore it in your life. If you pick the first one, it might mean that you commit to come to worship each Sunday. And if you're out of town, you find a little local church wherever you are to worship, or maybe you watch us on the webcast. Maybe you find other ways to sit in the presence of God. Maybe you come to Calvary on Sunday evenings at 5 p.m. and join the threshold in the chapel. Join the group of people who sit before God by praying in the style of Tze. If you choose the second call, maybe you start to actively pay attention to your language and behaviors and implicit biases. Ask others to be honest with you about how they experience your relationship with them. Read books and articles by authors who are very different than you. And most importantly, don't beat yourself up. Don't say, woe is me, when you realize that you've been doing something that's been less sensitive 
to others. Acknowledge it, be grateful you're awake and aware to it now, and change your behavior. Use confession as a catalyst for change. And if you choose the third call, just ponder this. What is God calling you to do in this world of unrest? Maybe you've heard this call before, but you've been making excuses saying, now is not a good time. Well, guess what? Remember that Isaiah's call came in the year that King Uzziah died. Now is the time to worship God more fully, to confess our sin and change our behavior more readily, and to answer God's call more willingly. In the summer of 2018, dot, 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 the rest is yours to fill. Amen.